I want to uh, welcome you, uh, Aida Muluni. Uh, we're very, very grateful that you're joining us now from Abidjan, uh, Ivory Coast. And I also want to welcome all attendees of this webinar and those who took the time to register. Uh, but before we start our conversation, I would like to say that this webinar is actually being live streamed on YouTube, so people can tune in directly uh, from there through our channel that is called the Africa Institute, which is a yellow circle uh, with our logo. Watch out because there are lots of fake uh, Africa Institute account there. So make sure you get to the authentic one. Uh, we're also recording this webinar uh, and then we will subtitle it and make it available uh, in Arabic and repost it on our uh, YouTube channel in the coming weeks for people who uh, missed it or people who want to rewatch it and also share it. So thank you, Aida. Uh, uh, I also, just before I delve into our conversation, which I expect to be rich and, 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 and thoughtful and insightful, uh, I want to thank the Sharjah Museum Authority and the Sharjah Art Museum staff, uh, especially Alia Al-Mulla -Al and uh, the head of the Sharjah Museum Authority, uh, Manal Ataya, and I also want to thank the Sharjah Art Foundation, uh, all the staff, all the technical staff, uh, but I want to mention specifically Hur Al Qasimi, Nawar Al Qasimi, Engineer Hassan, Engineer Yunus, and especially all the technical staff who did amazing job in, in installing the work. Uh, this uh, has to be said that this is actually a collaboration and a unique one between the uh, Africa Institute, uh, the Sharjah Art Foundation, and the uh, Sharjah Art Museum. Um, we will at the end open the floor uh, for questions and sometime maybe in the middle of the webinar itself. Uh, so if you have questions, please note that uh, there is, uh, you can write them in the question and answer sections on Zoom. Uh, if you're watching through YouTube, uh, please leave it as a comment. We hope to have the time to answer as many questions, of course, as possible. Um, I want to just make a note for people who probably missed that, that the virtual exhibition uh, has been visited by close, and we're happy to, to announce that, by more than 2,000 people. Uh, so the museum has announced that it now actually opened, which is another good news that uh, to receiving visitors. So please check their uh, website. That's the website of the Sharjah Art Museum and also the social media account to get more information on visiting hours and days because there are specific conditions in relation to COVID-19. Um, this conversation, and I had to take too much time for the introduction, I'll be as brief as possible, is uh, conceived as part of a, a program or, of an exhibition that is um, curated uh, in two parts. One is, uh, Ida Moloney, a homebound, uh, or Ida Moloney's homebound, a journey in photography, which is curated by myself, Salah Hassan, uh, with Sotan Al Hassan as associate a curator. Uh, the exhibition basically chronicles uh, Ida Moloney's journey as an artist and a photojournalist, and her multiple contribution to image, uh, imaging and image making in the photographic based work since her return to her homeland, Ethiopia, in 2007, after years of living and studying uh, abroad. Uh, there is a second part to it that's actually curated by Aida uh, Moloney herself, which is basically a retrospective, a selected one that of Eddie's PhotoFest, uh, which is a, a very well-known uh, and a unique, uh, and one of among maybe two, or the first actually in East Africa, that is Eddie's, Eddie's PhotoFest. Uh, which she established in 2010 in Addis Ababa. Uh, it's a biennial of photography and is organized by DESTA for Creative Consulting, which is also an organization that uh, I the head. Um, I think for many of the people who actually either visited the show or the website, uh, I think it is, they know enough about Ida Mullen's, uh, you know, uh, biography, but I will just briefly say she was born in Ethiopia, uh, she left the country at a very young age and spent an itinerant childhood between Yemen and England uh, and after and the United States and Canada 
And after several years of living in a boarding school in Cyprus, she finally settled in Canada in 1985. And in 2000, uh, she graduated for, with a degree from the communication department uh, with a major in film from Howard University uh, in Washington, DC. And of course, she pursued a life as a photojournalist and they shifted to another genre of image making, not to say that photojournalism is not art. I think it's an art in and of itself, but she shifted to a more uh, uh, art uh, image based uh, work. Of course, she is well known internationally, widely, and you can consult uh, the website for more uh, on her uh, uh, well known uh, exposure. She was also uh, collected by many museums. Uh, she's not noted or publishing many, many uh, publications. And among that, she's also a leading expert in, in photography, which is, uh, as an expert, uh, many people call for her expertise in either juring or advising and so forth. So uh, let us begin the conversation, Ida. So welcome again. The way I like to structure our conversation, actually, is to move around a series of questions which take us uh, almost like a walk through uh, your exhibition, which is basically uh, curated selectively, if I might say, uh, as a, in a retrospective manner. So let's start with your early work as a photojournalist and uh, an artist too. Uh, what I notice is that, uh, that you have been, you have a, after your graduation from Howard University, uh, which is, I wanna ask you a question separately about this, but, uh, I'm curious also about the shift from photojournalism into this. You've had a, a flourishing career as a, a freelancer that worked with the Washington Post. Your work has been uh, exhibited in the cover of, of many, many uh, big US, US outlets, and inter outlets and also international journals. Um, but let me begin before that, because I know you studied at Howard. It's, it's, a historically a very important uh, black institution, just considering what is going on today. Uh, and uh, you've studied with one of the, um, I would expect so, with Haile Garima, who is also an Ethiopian uh, uh, you know, comrade uh, that I'm sure uh, you must have known and he's one of your winters. So tell me about that experience of an Ethiopian immigrant diasporic figure who is also a highly cosmopolitan by upbringing and movement around. How, 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 you know, how, how is your experience at Howard University? Well, my journey at Howard actually started um, because of uh, Professor Abby Ford, who I had known <clears throat> before, but I, I hadn't met him. And uh, I actually wasn't in School of Communication, I was in School of Business. My plan was to study international business and then go into law. This was the plan that I had. And when I met, uh, you know, we call him Gashabi, when I met him, he also introduced me to Haile Garima. And basically they both decided that I was in the wrong department. So they pulled me into communication and uh, you know, they said it would be a waste for me to be pursuing you know, a law degree when I had you know, this talent in the visuals. Um, but the experience there was really interesting. Uh, you know, I learned a lot. Um, and as you know, Haile played a, a major role to many of the students as it relates to us understanding what visual communication is. And that experience as well, uh, sort of broaden my understanding of just the global perspective when we talk about communication. So when I was at Howard, it wasn't just a focus on cinema, you know, we had to learn radio, television, you know, all these different forms, but obviously our specialization was in, uh, I mean, my specialization was in cinema. And through that, uh, you know, there's always this identity thing that you go through as an African going to an institution that's African American and trying to find your way through it. And because I've lived in so many parts of the world, it was always, you know, trying to find my identity. And eventually, you know, I realized that, uh, you know, growing up abroad as an immigrant, you always, you know, inside your home, you're one culture, outside your home, you're functioning in a different culture. But I chose to attend Howard because um, I felt that just, you know, for me primarily because, you know, Gashabi was there and also Hale Grima were there. They also understood the context of where I was coming from, you know, as an African, as an immigrant, you know, uh, trying to, 
sort of uh, be in this field. And through that, uh, you know, it was a very wonderful experience. And, uh, you know, I've, I've really, you know, what was given to us was something that I don't think you can find in another institution because you actually got a sense of learning about cinema, not just from one perspective, but looking at the global perspective of cinema. So when we're talking about African cinema, Latin America, Middle East and so forth, and I even remember Haile, you know, he would make such a great effort to get us, you know, uh, films that were impossible to get a hold of just to be part of that, that class. So uh, it was quite a rewarding experience. And uh, it's one of those memories that I cherish of going to school there. Yeah, that, that's wonderful to hear because Haile Gerim, of course, uh, is, 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 is important in what came to be known as said cinema and said, you know, film aesthetics. And he's one of the major theorists of that. And, for people who don't know him, he's an important figure in, 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 in film and he's known with the film Sankofa. So uh, mm -hmm. you started a career right after Howard as a photojournalist and you have a flourishing career and it was uh, highly respected. So why this uh, the sudden shift or it might sound to me as a sudden shift and uh, it would be interesting also Satan who is helping with this webinar maybe just uh, flash some images of your work, which is in and of itself is interesting, but I would like for you to talk about that. So are, you, are you asking me the, the shift from cinema to photography or the shift from photojournalism to no, but, fine but art? The shift from cinema to photography, I guess understood. It's image yeah. making and uh, it's easier to do photography than have the whole with the lack of funding to do film. Well, my, my conclusion was that it will probably take me a, a lifetime to produce, you know, five films, you know. So my my whole idea was that I, I needed to say something. And as you know, making a film is quite challenging in itself. So I decided to build my career through photojournalism because this was something that it was just myself and the subjects or myself and the environment or the space. Um, but I know like for Haile, he always complains that, you know, when am I going to make my film? Why haven't I made it so far and so forth? But this is something that, that I will eventually get into. But at that time, um, I did enter the film world. I was making, you know, small documentaries. But uh, I felt that there was just a sense of urgency that I wanted to produce images in whatever form that it exists in. So I decided, well, let me pursue photojournalism. And, uh, you know, even working at the Washington Post, that would not have been possible without, you know, uh, my mentors such as Dudley Brooks. Um, <clears throat> even earlier on, Chester Higgins was one of my mentors. And so I decided that I have to do a building block in this visual world. So I needed to build sort of my visual aesthetics. I needed to build uh, what I wanted to document. And I realized that uh, earlier on, my focus was gonna be on this question of representation. And as you know, Salha, you know, when people think of Ethiopia, they think of the famine or the war, the political issues. And when I started, it was really to try to focus on sort of showing the other side uh, of that coin, that just as you have uh, suffering and misery, you also have joy and victory. And that became sort of my mission of even like going back to Ethiopia as well. Yeah, it would be great if, if you can just tell us more about your experience with the Washington Post and with photojournalism in and of itself as a day-to-day -day Yeah, experience. I mean, working at the Washington Post was probably the toughest thing that I did because it's highly competitive. Uh, there aren't a lot of people of color uh, in there. I was lucky enough at that time because, you know, there was Dudley Brooks who was still shooting. Uh, there was also my editor named Vanessa Hill who uh, was very tough on me, you know, uh, sometimes showing up in the edit room was like showing up naked and, you know, being judged in a way. But they understood that in order for me to succeed, it wasn't just giving 100%. I had to give 1,000%, especially as a person of color. Um, and also, you know, the other editor that I had was Michael Ducille. Uh, you know, unfortunately, he passed away. But that experience really made me understand that, and I've mentioned this before, you know, five photographers can show up at the same location, but come up with different perspectives. And that's when I understood the power of the image and how the image can form perceptions and create perspectives within that. So through that experience, uh, I had a, you know, a very clear sense of the power of media and also you know, the lack of diversity within that. And through that experience as well, uh, I really became a, you know, a better photographer. I, I realized when I entered the post, I, you know, my, my work wasn't that good, but they kept pushing me. And uh, you know, the post is a, is a place where it's sort of your boot camp 
So through that, and even to this day, what I keep saying is that, you know, photojournalism for me is the foundation of photography. That's what I believe in. And you have to learn how to tell the story. So sometimes we'd be sent, you know, to a very boring assignment and you had to come back with something amazing, you know? And that meant that you had to keep digging. You had to push yourself uh, to find the magical moment in that space and time and to try to tell the full story of what you're seeing with your eyes for the audience who is not physically there. So I, I want to just walk you through uh, uh, Satan. I don't know if you have the images ready. Uh, the two, two sets of images from uh, two series of work from the, your early photojournalist work. One is called Light and Shadow. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this is one of those beautiful ones that is a, car, uh, a girl in a car and the coffee shop. And then we will walk through the pass forward, which is from 2009. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say a few words, that would be helpful. Interesting. So yeah, so this first collection was actually the first time that I was coming back to Ethiopia uh, after I had left. And, um, you know, I, it was in a sense for me because I was coming back to my country that I've always dreamt about or, you know, I've heard stories of from my mother and coming back to it was trying to reconnect with the culture to try to understand, you know, what my birthplace was. And I didn't want to document like this touristical images. I wanted to sort of document the, the fabric of the society. So for example, this image, uh, I was walking on the street and I saw this man, you know, with his daughter and it was really fascinating. And to me, I just went up to them and I said, would you mind if I take a photo of you? And they said, sure. And I took this image and it became you know, one of my favorite images, just from the, the gaze of the, the eyes of the girl and, you know, uh, and the father, you know, as you can see, is very proud and, and what have you. But, I, you know, in a way, like I was creating sort of like a family album that I never had in Ethiopia because, you know, I left too early. So there weren't a lot of photos of me inside the country. So I started just taking photos randomly in different places, things that moved me, things that I found interesting. And these were one of the images uh, also that was exhibited in the Bamako Biennale in 2007. Um, but it was a way for me to explore uh, Ethiopia from my first arrival. And at this time I was actually shooting analog. So this is actually a, not a digital image, it's an analog uh, you know, film uh, image. And the main challenge in Ethiopia is you know, the sun is very bright. So uh, I went there with, you know, 400 uh, speed film for those that are in analog. And I realized that everything that I shoot had to go into the interior. So when you see a lot of the collection in this section, most of the images are interiors because the sun outside was quite intense. Yeah, we can take, uh, I just want to mention that you won an award, I guess, at, at, the, at the BAM photography. Uh, yeah, it's I, I won the uh, European Union Prize uh, in 2007. That was the year that Simon Jami, that, that was the first time I was meeting him. And that was the, uh, the first time that I actually arrived in Bamako, uh, meeting other photographers from different parts of Africa and the diaspora. And I would have to say this was probably the turning point in my career. Because, you know, when you live in the States and you're speaking about Africa, there's a disconnect, you know, and I always felt like a stranger trying to tell people about Africa. But when I went to Bamako, it was almost like I had an epiphany and I realized, wow, there's other photographers in Africa that are dealing with the same issues and are trying to address it in similar ways. So I realized that there was a family connection there, that there, there was uh, people that I can speak to and have discussions with, which I, can, I couldn't necessarily have those discussions in the US. So it was quite an important uh, moment in my career for me. Yeah, I want to just go uh, quickly through another image so we can allow. Uh, there is the image from the pa pa passport, which, which is, this is another, I guess, image, the coffee yeah. shop. So this and one is still from the, this is still from the first trip, uh, the, the previous one in the coffee shop. Uh, this one was actually uh, part of a book that was published by Africalia in Belgium called the Ethiopia Pass Forward. Um, on this collection, I spent about two months uh, traveling uh, by car through different regions in Ethiopia. And it, it was really a way for me to try to sort of understand more of the whole country as opposed to just Addis Ababa. So for example, this image uh, was uh, in a uh, Quran school. You know, I'm not Muslim, but my family is half Muslim. And I was always fascinated to learn more about the, you know, the Islam religion in Ethiopia. And I did quite an extensive work uh, in relation to Islam in Ethiopia. 
And these were girls who actually uh, were too shy to show me their face. And they said they, they would only allow me to take photos of them if they covered up. But then when they covered up, it just made the image even more beautiful because everything came back to the focus of the eyes. And they were, you know, quite shy. But for me, it was, this is one of my favorite images. Yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll just quickly show two other images from the Thames series, uh, Savan. If you can, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. So this image was actually right in front of the hotel that we stayed at. This is in the city of Dese in Wello. Um, you know, the, the great beauty in Ethiopia is that uh, people express their love, you know, quite public, like friends, you know, and it was always fascinating to me to see, you know, you see women holding hands, you see men holding hands, and, you know, we're a society that's quite affectionate uh, to each other. And for me, I just literally walked out and I saw these two girls, so I decided to take this photo. So in each CD, I was basically having these different encounters and just, you know, going through the process of documenting as much as I can. You know, I, I want to shift, um, uh, and I guess at this point, I want to really just emphasize the question more is that why the shift? Why is this shift suddenly? Because what we are going to go through now is a series of the, uh, it's part of the series that you worked on since 2013. And we, we want to start with Inferno, but before getting to that, uh, if you can just tell us briefly that, that the shift to this uh, type of different type of image making. Right. There right. are more colorful, there are involved a more, uh, uh, you know, kind of complex. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it, the, a large body of my work, uh, most of it is focused in black and white. I've always said that I feel comfortable in black and white because everything for me is about structure, it's about shadows, it's about uh, composition. And when I was shooting color yeah. photography, unless the color was not jumping at me, I, I, I can't seem to get into it. But I realized that uh, when I started getting into the fine artwork, uh, it was an opportunity for me to express the things that I couldn't express in photojournalism. And you know, people ask me, you know, where do I get the inspiration? And I always say the inspiration really comes from all these different assignments that I've done throughout Ethiopia. These things motivate me and inspire me. So that comes out into ideas, into the fine art. And the beginning of this actually started, the, the face painting started when I was still at Howard. Um, and I've spoken about this before. I did one piece called Spirit of Sisterhood, which is uh, currently in the permanent collection at the uh, Smithsonian, at the African Art Museum. And that image was in black and white. And I didn't think much of it, I left it alone. And then when Simone was doing the planning for the Divine Comedies uh, exhibition, he asked, you know, please think about something, a body of work that you wanna work on. And so I decided, okay, should I get back into the face painting? And then I did it and uh, basically everything just it started making sense. And, you know, the key thing is that, you know, it takes a long time to find your style. Uh, you know, you can understand the technical of photography, you can, understand moments of timing, but each photographer is always seeking what is their true voice. And for me, I felt like this work was what I wanted to uh, work towards because it's something that I felt like it was almost like my therapy or it was almost like a, a way for me. As Haile says, you know, uh, Haile Grimm always says, art is about vomiting everything that's inside of you and being able to uh, express it uh, in a way that's truthful uh, from you. So when Simone asked me to do uh, this collection, I didn't know what the reaction would be, if this would be too strange or how it would be, but it was really me presenting what I felt inside. And my section was really focused on the inferno. And so my philosophy was that, uh, you know, I've, and I've said this in different interviews is that for me, hell is not something that you die and you go to. I believe hell exists on the ground as well. And so I started thinking about, you know, the masks that people wear, you know, for to get ahead in life or to be famous or to conceal their emotion or whatever it is. Uh, so I started focusing towards this painted bodywork. And through that, I made uh, seven pieces. So this collection is actually seven parts. Uh, and this is based on in the Inferno in uh, Dante's book, I think it's Canton uh, 20. And the story is about uh, three different people who were uh, using sorcery to get ahead in life or you know, they, they were using mystical powers and so forth. And so they were sent to hell. And basically uh, there was one really interesting line where there was a woman with her head turned backwards 
so that she can never see the future and she always has to see the past. So for, etern for eternity, her head is turned back and you know, for eternity she's crying and her tears are falling down her back. And I thought that was so powerful uh, and I wanted to just focus on that. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting uh, that is, and I'm just quoting here something you said about the series is that the internal, which is referencing of course the divine comedy uh, is made of history, not only of country, but of self exile, of bloodshed, of loss, of mourning, of bitterness, of broken hearts and broken wings. The inferno is not down below, it is here, ever present next to us in our memories and in our minds. Um, so uh, with this, uh, I, I want to just shift uh, to the, um, the wolf uh, uh, that you feed, which is the series from 2014. To me, it is more painterly than the other ones, uh, than the earlier one, even though color is there. Uh, and you preface it with this Cherokee proverb. And I wonder if you can say more about these images and you could stop at any image and talk more if you wish. Right. I mean, if, for me, that it's a lot of the work that I do is has a lot to do with my own self, my, my personality and the things that I've experienced or the things that I'm curious about. Um, when I found this Cherokee proverb, I thought it was really fascinating because how we perceive our life is really based on how we choose, you know, if, if, if we're living a life of miseries because we're putting in all the misery into ourselves or uh, if we choose to live a life of happiness, we have to choose what, you know, what we put inside of ourselves. So when I read that, uh, a lot of the, the pieces were also, you know, when you look at the titles, it's a lot of it is based also on biblical uh, I don't know, ideologies. Uh, and I really wanted to make a statement because at the end for me, it's also the, the question of our own humanity, of who we are as individuals, but at the same time, how do we relate to the other? And how we relate to the other also has to do something with who we are you know, within ourselves. So we have to also know who we are within ourselves before we can deal with the other. And through these collections, you know, each phase of it, this was the second part of my collection that I did, I wanted to explore these notions, uh, you know, dealing with uh, emotions, dealing with uh, just interactions. And at the same time, it was trying to explore, for example, if you look at this image, I do these line drawings. So I was exploring the line drawing idea to see, uh, you know, how that would work out. And so, you know, I, I was exploring this in the second phase. And then when, you know, when we get to the world is nine, uh, then I started expanding. So in, in each form, in each form of uh, the different collections, it's the progression of my artistic uh, world. So for example, for me, starting out in photojournalism, starting out in black and white, it's almost like an artist uh, starting out with charcoal or pencil drawing, and then eventually going into color and understanding color and then going into other forms. So for me, each step by step, uh, you know, in the world is nine, my focus became, okay, let me explore the primary colors. So a lot of the work is based on the red, the blue, uh, the yellow, and then black and white, because I felt like I was still at the infancy as an artist, and I was still exploring how color relates to the emotions that I have and what is it that I, that I want to share. And even, for example, this image, you know, I've, I've used different locations. Uh, so for example, this is in uh, Legahar in Addis Ababa, the train station that I used to uh, go to Djibouti. And I found these spaces quite fascinating um, because it also spoke about my memory of departure, you know, when I first left Ethiopia, but at the same time also, you know, how to connect it uh, with my own emotions uh, as far as being an Ethiopian, coming back to Ethiopia and understanding um, sort of where my place is within that society. And the dedication to my grandmother, you know, my grandmother always said, you know, the world is nine she's never a perfect 10. And it was really the understanding that, you know, this world is not perfect, but I think we have to strive towards the perfection, but understanding that things will never be perfect. Interestingly, there is a story that you tell in the article by Nalika that uh, this station was built by the French at some point to connect Addis and Ethiopia with Djibouti. But right. that line never really function. Uh, I was wondering if that had to do with the... Uh, no, I mean, the, the line was functioning. Uh, it, it was, you could still, I mean, the conditions were not the best, you know, over the years, but the line was still working. Uh, even now, actually, there's a new train line that goes to Djibouti that the government has built 
Um, but the space was quite fascinating for me. And, uh, you know, people were going back and forth, you know, passing through Harar and so forth. So uh, the train worked, but over the years, it became dysfunctional. The tracks were not working. So they decided to stop. Uh, I think it might have been, when I arrived, I don't think the train was working, if I'm not mistaken, but I think it's been at least 12 years or something like that since this specific line, uh, you know, since they've, they've discontinued it. But, uh, but to me, it was really about that space. Um, and you have to remember, for example, in the station, there is the actual uh, train cart of uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, the one that was, you know, donated by uh, Queen Elizabeth, which, you know, is, is preserved quite well. But in the full space, uh, there's a lot of pieces of history that uh, I, I found quite interesting and I wanted to do the, the photo shoot there. Most of the time, this space is used for weddings. So when I showed up and they saw this crazy stuff, uh, you know, they were wondering, you know, what is this? But because normally they see wedding photographers coming in to, to do the bride and groom. And here I was doing like this painted faces and blue material. But, uh, but for me, it was, it was quite a unique experience. I think the next image we speak to something unique of Ethiopia and Africa, which is a Dinkanish, uh, that the mother of all of us, <laughs> right. in a way. Uh, and then uh, I want you to speak about this, but also the next image, uh, Satan, if you can show it. And this image is specifically, if I believe in conspiracy theory, I would say that you predicted the virus because oh. this, this looks like the new Norman with the gloves and the, uh, the mask. But anyway, let's go back to Dinkinish. <laughs> I just thought it was interesting to look at your images that are from 2016. Right. Uh, but tell us more about this. Yeah. So th this, uh, uh, this channel, yeah. right. So uh, the inception of this image started out as part of an exhibition called uh, Lucy's Iris, and it was commissioned uh, for a big show discussing, you know, Dick Ganesh with which Westerners refer to as Lucy, which is the, the first person in the world. Most people forget that humanity began in Ethiopia and some people think I'm be being too Ethiopian and too nationalistic for that, but that's the history. But uh, I, I had gone to this factory that makes cement uh, for a commercial work. And I showed up there and, and I saw this huge mound of pebbles and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And, and you know, I, I mentioned this because you don't know where the inspiration is gonna come from. So I showed up at the cement factory uh, and for something completely different. And then I decided to come back to do my artistic work. And that was the, the stage staging for it. But what I wanted to show it, it's actually a three part piece. My curiosity was, you know, here was a woman who was the first one to walk upright, uh, you know, uh, even the curiosity of like what happened to her because, you know, they found their, her bones and so forth. But I started imagining that often, I think as women, we, we forget the power that we have, you know, we, we forget the impact that we can have on society. And here, here was the first woman, first one to walk upright, but she had no notion of the strength that she had. She had no notion of what it meant for the future of humanity. And so when you when you look at the three pieces, the first one she's laying down uh, with her eyes closed. And to me, this is where you are unaware and not conscious. The second one is she is struggling to walk up uh, sort of this mound. And the third one, she stands in victory. So this collection meant a lot to me. And it was just a way to sort of uh, to show the strength of women and how we can be part of change, how we can be part of uh, society and also part of the future. Yeah, to me, actually, the pose, uh, uh, the, 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 the form itself, uh, the landscape and the way she's positioned is almost uh, commemorative. And that's just remind me of the statues that are now falling. I hope right. one in Ethiopia would erect something that's inspired by this because what is more interesting is that she's lively, She's triumphant. She's looking at us, mm. and in this kind of a real pedestal that is actually nature, not something uh, done. No, I mean the, the funny thing with this story is that uh, the security guy was, uh, you know, really suspicious. He was trying to kick us out because he thought it was like some crazy stuff that we were doing, and then, uh, you know, I had to figure out a way to keep him busy. So, like in the outtake, the guy is actually at the bottom throwing the cloth in the air. So we had to distract them just to get the shot in. 
but uh, but for me, I, wa I wanted to show that strength. This was like the final shot that I did uh, for this. And it was, you know, it, it's one of the uh, the powerful images for me of just showing the, the resilience and the red color for me, it's, you know, it means so much, you know, it's passion and it's uh, strength, it's life, you know, all these things. But uh, yeah, I, I do wish that in Ethiopia that we would have statues of women heroes because we don't really have that. And I think there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of women in our history who have been part of the, the change of the society. I even did a book called Tim Salet, looking at prominent women of our history. So there's a lot to discuss in that sense. The, the next image is actually uh, interesting in terms of the composition. Uh, it seems like there is an old photograph, a historic one, and something that you composed. And there's, there's like an idea of mirroring and I'm, I'm wondering about that composition. I mean, if you can talk more. I mean, whenever you see the black and white checkered floor, it's my dedication to Malik Sidi Bey, which for many of us, he, uh, you know, is an important figure. Uh, I've met him a few times, uh, even the first time when I arrived in Bamako. So it's sort of like a shout out to him. Um, but the story of this is just, it's about uh, a distant love or a lost love. And we have this saying uh, where a woman is waiting for her lover to return from wherever. And, and unfortunately, English is such a overly technical, non-poetic language for me uh, in comparison to Amharic. But it basically refers that this woman is, is waiting and her eyes, uh, her youthful eyes melt like snow. This is the, the full uh, expression in it. We, we'll move forward. I think memories in development is actually very intriguing for me because it is takes a title from the work of uh, Thomas Guterres, uh, the Cuban uh, filmmaker. And, and uh, it, to me, it's intriguing because Cuba is a place that we idealize in terms of, uh, you know, the anti-imperialist and uh, liberation and decolonization era, you know, tricontinentalism, all of those things. So I'm curious about your take on it and, and if you can talk more about it. I mean, in, in regards to development, um, I guess for me is that we are moving towards modernity without the negotiation of our past and our history. This is always my concern. And when we speak about, you know, uh, you know, development, especially in Ethiopia, there has to be this negotiation process. So, for example, uh, for me, development is not just about infrastructure. It's not about building roads and structures and so forth. It's also about the development of the society as a whole. So in that sense, uh, what I look for is really how do we develop our minds, you know, how, how do we, uh, you know, when you, when you look at Addis Ababa, we, we consume a lot of things that are from outside when it comes to culture, but at the same time, we also have our own culture. And my fascination with that is that I, I feel that we have to create our own uh, future and we also have to find ways to create our own systems uh, for the society. So in that sense, you know, being, for example, in Cote d'Ivoire and being in Ethiopia, it's two different realities. You know, when you talk about colonial past, you know, in Ethiopia, we don't have that colonial past. So how we're moving forward to the future is basically, you know, our own sort of chaos that we're moving towards. Whereas here, the remnants of colonial past is very present, you know. So, so in that sense, when I was doing the uh, memoirs and development, it was really about that discussion, uh, you know, dealing with, for example, migration, you know, I'm always fascinated, you know, when, when I show up at an airport, uh, how we're all treated, you know, just by the color of our skin, unfortunately. And sometimes they ask you really ridiculous stories. Like for me, they ask me, why do I live in Ethiopia? And my response is because I want to live in Ethiopia, you know? So, so there's a lot to, to speak about, especially for those of us that travel and for those of us that have migrated and also in relation to, um, to our history and for me, because I, I exist between the Western world and the African world, uh, I am the inside outside person. And so a lot of the things that I see, uh, I find quite interesting, but also I feel like there's more conversation that we need to have uh, in relation to also, you know, when it comes to African people who have who've been dispersed globally. You know, I, I just this image is specifically on the screen that everybody knows about Mississippi. Right. I, I am curious about it and, and the composition, which is actually wonderful, but of course surreal mm -hmm. and somewhat sad. Uh, right. Yeah. 
No, I mean, this obviously uh, is going back to, you know, the history in the U.S. when it deals with African-Americans. Uh, I'm sure you know the song by Nina Simone, uh, you know, and it was really inspired uh, by her. And what I felt was that, you know, here is America, which is a society that is supposed to be, you know, overly developed, uh, the biggest producer of culture and, you know, all these civil rights movements. But I realized at the same time, the oppression hasn't really ended. You know, uh, things have silently stayed uh, within the, the, the same context as 50 years ago when we talk about race relation and even what's happening now, this is nothing new. You know, this has been going on for 400 years. So, uh, so I wanted to create this work about, you know, uh, we have the choice of our own freedom is in our hands. That's how I see it, you know, but sometimes we think that our freedom is at the hand of somebody else, but everything comes back to coming out of the cage uh, and not creating a cage for our, for our own future and our own reality. So, I mean, I guess we are almost there. This is one of the most fascinating and it's an image that, uh, which is from the Distance Gaze series. Uh, we've used for all our publicity and it's, it's an amazing image. It, it's also very surreal. So if you can walk at this through two examples uh, that actually I find it more surreal than, than the others, uh, but it's interesting and almost like a dreamy world. Right. So the previous one of the return of the departure, uh, that one I actually uh, took the photo in Langano. Uh, which is a, a crater lake. And uh, to me, it, it was really the conversation about uh, African women migrating. And as you know, uh, there's a lot of migration happening through Libya, you know, people dying in the ocean, all these things. And, and in a strange way, what I was thinking about was that I, f I found it fascinating that the ocean has become our graveyard in a sense. So if you look at the transatlantic slave trade, and now in the contemporary, you look at this migration, uh, not through slavery, but migration of trying to get to a better world, we're still dying in this ocean. And so this is why I say, you know, the return of the departure. And uh, what I was fascinated also about is that even uh, looking at the past history, you know, of this disbursement of African people in different parts of the world, it's through that, that, you know, when are we going to stop leaving? When, when are we going to realize that we, we have to work uh, on the ground? Uh, because, I, and I've said this to you before, you know, the, the grass is never greener on the other side, you know, and I've traveled in Europe, you know, I've spoken to different new migrants uh, that, especially in Italy, and it's quite um, sad in, in a sense that our youth uh, find that they have no option but to leave the country and to risk their lives. So in this sense, uh, when I did this photo shoot, even when you see her, her face is actually in the water. And at that time, you know, the lake, it's, it's a very cold water. You know, uh, it wasn't exactly comfortable, but I thought it was really relevant to express it in this form because I, I felt like, uh, you know, there's always one study that I wanted to do was really how do African women, you know, what are the, the challenges that they go through uh, migrating to a different place, whether they're going as workers in the Middle East, whether they're going to Europe to, uh, you know, to find a better life uh, through North Africa, you know, th there's all these components in it. And this was really a dedication to that. And it was really speaking about this migration uh, of, of our people to different parts of the world, thinking that th there's a better world out there, but in reality, they face a whole set of other issues uh, in these different places. I, I want to just shift to the memories of hope, which is actually uh, very uh, interesting because it has, I mean, you, you start really in a kind of a pessimistic um, uh, kind of note by saying, as we age, hope at times becomes elusive, while in our use it was distant mirage in the desert of optimism. But then you end up the same statement you said, but, but, but we are in a time in which passivity uh, is not an option. The violence of this world is not only rooted in those that profit from the toils of the disadvantaged, but it's also a manifestation of how we contribute uh, to maintaining our differences based on idealism of superiority and rampant. So there is a sense of, you know, talking back and so forth. But there are two images that struck me the most. And I thought this and the um, other one that is uh, with the watermelon, Satan, sorry. 
Yeah. If you can just talk about these two images, I, I thought in our earlier conversation, they were really fascinating, but also resonate very much with what's happening in the US. Yeah, I mean, I, I created this work, uh, the first one, uh, both sides was right after the Charlottesville, I don't know, this white supremacist uh, march or whatever that they had. And I remember in the news, uh, Trump was, was saying that, you know, it's the fault of both sides. And I thought that's very ironic because it's not about both sides. You know, it's, it's, it's about the oppressor and the oppressed. This, this is how I see it, especially when it comes to race relation. And I've said this before, you know, whenever you see bananas in my work, uh, for me, it, it started out as a dedication to the football player, Danny Alves, who was walking onto the football uh, field and somebody threw a banana at him and he decided to pick it up and eat it. And to me, it was, it was super fascinating that to take something so ugly that someone, you know, you're, you're going to do your job and someone is doing something very drastic or something that's, I don't know, quite ugly and how he decided to process it in his mind. And through that, I, I started, you know, realizing like it's racism has become so ridiculous that in the States, you know, even fruits have symbols related to racism. So for example, uh, if you look at the history of the watermelon, you know, after the Emancipation Proclamation, African-Americans were, you know, having good business by selling watermelons, but then they took the, you know, image, especially after Jim Crow, they, they took the image of the watermelon and associated it with these negative connotations really relating to African-Americans. So in that sense, uh, it's ridiculous for me, and this is what, I, what I'm exploring that you know, we're in this day and age and we're still having a conversation from whatever uh, time frame. And a lot of the times when people see this, uh, the American dream, for me, it's, it's not really a dream. It's actually a nightmare, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a nightmare that's like elusive. It's, it's not quite present, but then it's, it's there. So when you see the actual print, and I, and I hope uh, once the exhibition opens that people will go to this image, on the watermelon in the far right corner, there's actually a fly on there. And for me, it's like, you know, when, when you sit at, at a table about to eat this great meal or something that's really juicy and a fly lands on it, it kind of takes away from you wanting to eat it. And to me, this was a way of expressing the American dream is that it looks appetizing, it looks appealing, but deep down inside, you know, there are things that are not uh, quite comfortable in, in my opinion. And it, you know, when we talk about these oppressive systems, it's it's unfortunate. Uh, I hate to say this, but at the same time, I wanted to express it in this work uh, through this image. The last one is in this series that uh, I guess is the uh, seed of soul, and it's also a curious one. I mean, there's always the mass, there's always whether it's elusive or not. But in this case, there is the word salam, peace in it too. Uh, right. And I'm curious with the colors and the background and the checker falls, yes. Yeah, so uh, so this image uh, started out actually uh, by a painting by Norman Rockwell, who was doing uh, covers for, uh, I think it's the, uh, what is it, the New York Post, if I'm not mistaken. But it was actually a painting of uh, Ruby Bridges, who was the, she was, I don't know, I don't know how old she was. She, she was very young and she was one of the first students to be integrated into a school. So he has this painting of her uh, that she's walking and in the background in the wall, it has like tomatoes that have been thrown at her. You know, uh, it has the word, uh, you know, nigger on it. And for me, it was, it was really, um, you know, it's a sad thing for a young child to experience, you know, being assimilated for the first time to an all white school because it became a law. But then I imagine what her mental state was. And in that same sense, I started thinking about what had happened to the Muslim community after September 11th, that, uh, you know, especially for women, because, you know, Muslim women cover their heads or they cover fully, and they had to go through sort of, uh, you know, these moments of, you know, violence or uh, being uh, sort of uh, oppressed because of their beliefs. and. And my upbringing, when, when I think about Islam, it's something that is a beautiful religion. It's a religion of peace. Uh, unfortunately, when we talk about ISIS and all these terrorist groups, you know, that's the wrong interpretation of Islam. But again, I go back to the perceptions in the US is that uh, I find that a lot of the times, and this is where, you know, the, the media also leads this, is that 
people don't understand Islam, but then when they encounter somebody Muslim, there's always almost like a prejudice against that. So for me, it was just processing that, imagine you're Muslim female, minding your business, going day to day to activities, but then feeling all of these uh, negative sort of feedbacks based on just your religion, uh, even though they're supposed to be, you know, free religion and, and so forth. So I, I decided to create this because even in my language, uh, salam means peace. Um, and it was just a way for me to explore that notion that sometimes you have to fight for what you believe in and what is inside of you. And I felt that uh, this was a way that I could express it in this image. Um, I think we, we shift, I think, to the last of the series that we surveyed in the show, which is about water. Mm -hmm. And as Fela said, water, no good enemy. Uh, water has no enemy. So, uh, but, but you, interestingly, you cited, um, uh, you almost related it to domesticity and, your, or your, and women work, and you cited this beautiful poem by Maya Angelou mm -hmm. as uh, kind of a segue to, to the images, but they are, the series is really fantastic, especially this one, which, which you also use for the, uh, the star shine. But tell us more about it and, and the water. Uh, yeah, so, so this work was commissioned by uh, Water Aid and uh, the H&M Foundation. Um, they contacted me uh, asking me if I'd be interested in working on the issues of water. Um, my main thing, you know, the first conversation that I had with them is I said, you know, I'm not interested in doing this typical NGO photo of, you know, the poor kid with the water in the hand or the, the well and so forth. So I asked them, you know, do I have a freedom to do the work the way that I want to do it? And they said, of course, and I, I found this to be quite interesting because they, they actually took a chance uh, in me to let me express it in the way that I wanted to express it. And the key thing that I wanted to focus on was how uh, water has a big impact on the lives of women, um, especially in the rural regions, which has an impact on health, on education, on upward mobility. And... And you have to remember, having access to water in Ethiopia is, is a major challenge uh, in, in the sense that, um, you know, women have to travel for long hours, you know, to just get water for the household. And a lot of the times when we live in the Western world uh, or in the comforts of our cities, don't realize how, you know, I, I always say electricity off and my water off, you know. So I built this collection. Uh, I shot most of it in Bar, uh, which is in the Danical Depressions. Uh, I think, Satan, could you alert her to, 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 to get off the, the webinar and, and enter again? Um, we are in the last, actually, yes, uh, sorry. In the last, it's, it's like a survey and we, we were going to shift to, uh, for Aida to speak about her own, uh, uh, you know, part of the show or the exhibition, which is basically a survey, a nine year survey of the Addis Photo Fest. Um, it includes, uh, this is the last work in that series, The Water Life, uh, hopefully she'll join us soon, but. I just want to say a few more words about uh, Addis uh, uh, Photo Fest that it has been uh, very successful as a festival of photography and a unique one in East Africa. And that actually complement the, 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 uh, the biennial of photography in Bamako. And um, it has emphasis more on African photographers, but also allowed, uh, and it gets, part of it is also a training program uh, and an incubator that, uh, that enables a lot of young photographers to uh, kind of uh, uh, enter into the uh, art world scene and get recognized. So Addis becomes really a place where people go uh, to kind of uh, seek uh, talent or look at work. Uh, either we, we shifted, unfortunately, uh, there is we just one last image of Sadan, if you go back, back to it, and then we start. I started telling people about your, uh, this photo of us for the sake of time, but uh, I'll just give a background, but I think you could um, just, we can just go to the, to the Addis photo. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, so the, uh, so the Addis Photo Fest was something that, uh, you know, when I first arrived in Addis Ababa in 2007, um, I realized that, you know, uh, in order to change the image of Ethiopia, we need to have more photographers. This was the only way that uh, we can be part of that global conversation. So uh, when I started the Addis Photo Fest in 2010, uh, it wasn't just to uh, give an opportunity to photographers, but it was also to show the community and society the different forms of photography and the different uh, perspectives that exist, not only from Ethiopia, but from Africa, from all over the world. And through that, uh, the Addis Photo Fest, you know, uh, we've grown over the years. Uh, we're currently in our sixth edition. Um, and we are really uh, a festival that has also supported a lot of photographers in Ethiopia. So for example, uh, Muluget Ayena, who uh, just recently won the uh, uh, World, World Press Photo Award, um, was a photographer that started out by exhibiting with us. And one thing that I realized that when I first started in 2010, I think we only exhibited about, I think six photographers from Ethiopia. Uh, in the last edition in 2018, we were close to, I think, 36 photographers from Ethiopia. And so having these kind of activities and having a festival, not just only exhibiting, but, you know, we were giving portfolio review, uh, you know, we were having conferences and lectures. Uh, this was really a, a proactive way for me to produce new talent and also uh, to let young photographers know that there is a space where they can get the education. There is a space that they can have interactions with photographers from around the world. So in the inception, uh, I wasn't so much interested in just doing like an African festival. I wanted to do an international festival because I do believe in building a global photography uh, sort of partnership or creating a bridge uh, with all photographers from around the world. So when we invite these photographers from Africa, you know, Latin America, Middle East and so forth, for many of them, it's their, their first time meeting, you know, for example, you know, you have a photographer from Brazil meeting a photographer from Nigeria and you know, they start having conversations and start building uh, a network. So the ultimate goal of uh, the Addis Photo Fest is really to create these bridges, but also to offer, you know, the global community that there is a talent. And, you know, ultimately my main focus is supporting photographers in Africa, but through these global partnerships. Um, it would be interesting just to go through images by the one by Molugeta, but then I guess uh, we can also uh, uh, just uh, survey. Uh, if you want to say a few words about Molugeta, uh, we can also go to George Senga, which so, is... So, so for, I mean, for me, Molugeta Ayena is, is uh, you know, I think one of the best uh, photojournalists that we have. Uh, the thing that I really respect about him is this is not a guy that's just taking photos because he has an assignment with AP. You know, this is a guy that has been shooting every day uh, because he feels a sense of urgency of documenting everything that's happening uh, in the city and also in, in the country. And this is one thing that I tell a lot of young photographers, you know, you don't go shooting because you have an, an assignment or I've told you, you know, you're part of a workshop, go shoot, you know. Uh, you know, at the end, especially for this young generation, they have to understand that they are the witnesses of today for tomorrow. And often what I, what I mention is that we have to document as much as possible because 30, 40 years from now, there's gonna be people that wanna know, you know, what did Addis Ababa look like? What did Ethiopia look like? What did the people look like? So it's part of that urgency. And, and as you know, Salha, you know, the, there's a lot that's changing in Ethiopia and there's a lot of changes that happen, especially in Addis Ababa. And often we forget what these changes are, uh, but when we see a photo, we say, oh, you know, this is quite fascinating. So for example, we, we've exhibited, you know, photographers such as Balat Atakle, uh, and a lot of the times when we exhibit archive images, you know, young people are so fascinated by these images that, you know, they, they realize, oh, this is where we were and this is where we are now. And now we can imagine where we need to be into the future. And Muligeta Ayena for me is that future uh, when we speak about, about photojournalism in Africa. So the, just if we can go to the next one, I think that's uh, George Senga, which is a series on Lumumba. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, George Senga's work is, you know, it's quite a beautiful work. Uh, it was, you know, uh, it's, it's speaking about Patrice Lumumba and really looking at, um, you know, if this hero was still alive, you know, where would he be or what would he be doing? And, you know, often when I'm exhibiting work, I'm not only looking at just photojournalism and only fine art. Uh, I'm also interested in different perspectives and different approaches. And for his uh, work, I found it quite fascinating. If you can go to the next slide, uh, so that they, if there's another slide. 
so yeah. for so so for me it's 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 his interpretation of you know sort of imagining you know if, if our heroes or if our African heroes were still alive you know what would they be doing and uh, you know where would they be at in their lives and for me this was you know quite a beautiful collection uh, and uh, George Senga is someone that I admire quite uh, dearly and to me especially for the Ethiopian audience it's for them to you know realize that there's different ways of expression. Uh, especially from the continent, that there's different ways of us uh, telling our stories. It's not just in one form. So having his work, for example, in the Sharjah Museum is quite relevant because it talks about the past. It talks about, you know, almost like a, this future memory. And it, it talks about, you know, uh, some of the, the, the history that I think that sometimes we, we haven't really processed, you know, or the future or the current generation is quite unaware of certain parts of history, especially when it comes to Africa, not only in Africa, but also globally. I think the last in this series, uh, this one too, uh, the drummers, and then she's a really a beautiful, uh, brilliant uh, series yeah, yeah. by Alice Pan. Yeah. So and Alice Pan yeah. Yeah, is a photographer from South Africa. Um, when she submitted her work, I mean, this was a beautiful collection. And the one thing that I've told her is that I really appreciated almost the sensitivity or the poetry in these images. You know, the, it's, it's a very delicate collection, but it's, it's a different way because often when we see images from South Africa, there tends to be a repetition, you know, uh, and I found that this was sort of a different way of uh, presenting it. And I thought it was quite sweet in a sense and innocent. But often we don't see this other side of the coin, you know, you know, the, the topic is, you know, of these drummies, it's a very simple topic, but no, you know, most of us don't know that this exists. And, and this is the key thing that I always tell photographers is don't capture, don't show us things we've already seen, show us something that we haven't seen, especially when you go into the mass media, all you have to do is just Google, you know, if you Google South Africa, look at the images that come up. If you Google Ethiopia, look at the images that come up. So in that sense, you know, I selected her for this show and also for the uh, Addis Photo Fest uh, because I, I, I found the work was quiet but has such great strength uh, in it. And, you know, she's done many great things and, uh, uh, you know, this is a photographer that I have a great deal of respect for. Uh, the last one, Satan, uh, this is a, a very fascinating series on the uh, albino, the, uh, uh, which is very problematic in the con in context of many African societies uh, right. where they are vilified and so forth. But it would be good that if you can talk about this, because yeah. it's a very fascinating series of works. Right. So uh, Sarah is uh, from Uganda, but she's based in Kenya. And uh, the way I came across her work uh, was uh, she? She was part of a, a competition in Uganda. It's the Uganda Press Photo Awards, and um, the thing that I liked about Sarah was that I knew that she was a working photographer because she submitted almost in every category, and she was winning almost every category in that award. And there was even a conversation, you know, is she getting too many awards? And my philosophy is that if someone did the work you know, they should, they deserve the award, not based on, you know, I don't know, pettiness or, or having pity that we have to give an award to somebody else. So uh, I was following her work and her career. And then um, when she when she proposed this collection that I exhibited also in the Addis Photo Fest, it was fascinating for me because I've seen a lot of images in regards to, you know, albinos in Africa. But this was unique for me because this woman is actually an activist uh, and she's the one that's really fighting uh, for the rights of uh, albinos. And I found that fascinating that she, she didn't choose to do the typical thing of, you know, those that are suffering, you know, she chose to give it some strength uh, to it. And through this work, you know, it was presented in Arles. Uh, I had nominated her for the Discovery Award, which she won the grand prize. And, you know, uh, and the, the work speaks in itself, you know, it's, 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 it's something that is quite unique. Uh, and I've always, you know, admired even all her work that she's been doing even after this. And so Sarah is one of those photographers for me in Africa that can exist like me between photojournalism and fine art. So this is what I, I see in her, in her representation, because I'm sure before she created these images, she knew of the story and she was trying to figure out how she's going to tell the story that wasn't in the typical way. And she chose this form of expressing it. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm going to, because of, of the sake of time, there's a lot of questions, but there's also lots of messages of love. Oh, okay. full of, uh, personal greeting, admiration of your work. Some are friends, some are even relatives who come in to say they're checking on you and uh, she's the sister of someone. So I don't want to go through all of that, but I, I loved it and I love that kind of interaction. But I selected like just two or three questions. One is uh, so we can end up with this not to take too much time. So, uh, because I think what you have said is rich in and of itself and it, it's not uh, easy and we can continue all night. There is a question that I find interesting and I was uh, going to ask you, I mean, you are successful in the field, of course, uh, but the question goes like this, what do you find most frustrating to deal with in the art world? Do you think that uh, the way artist art is judged is adequate or would you like to change things? That's one question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think uh, it's the superficiality of the art world that that's the biggest issue uh, for me. Um, I don't create work to create to seek validation. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy that people like my work, that I have collectors and, you know, I, I get to enter these shows. But the first thing for me is that uh, what is key and important is, and, and I've seen this often, is that a lot of photographers, you know, enter, for example, the European market, and they think that's the end all of everything. They don't realize you got to keep continue working, you know, as artists, it's, you know, sometimes you have to be careful that you don't become sort of the one hit wonder uh, in that sense. And to me, it's, uh, you know, I remember after I won the prize in, uh, in Bamako, before I won the prize, I was a nobody. Nobody knew who I was, anything. But I'm still the same person, you know? And as you, as you get, I guess, more recognition and more prestige and so forth, uh, everything comes back to the ego. And one thing that I realized that in the art world, the biggest challenge is being able to deal with that. It's also a battle uh, within yourself. And for me, it comes back to, um, you know, you have to know yourself. That's what it comes down to. But the art world has a way of bringing you up and taking you down, you know? And these are the things that I, that I often think about, uh, but I try to maintain, uh, you know, my centeredness. I, I try to remain humble within that. Um, but the art market is finicky in itself. And, and I've said this before, you know, it's not about, you know, right now Africa is popular, you know, everything is, you know, out there and so forth. But we've been doing work for a while now. It's not because we've been recognized that we just started working. And this is where the art world has to change. It has to see beyond, uh, you know, beyond what is popular. They have to do their research, you know. Uh, we should not be sort of the token African that enters into these spaces. So I, I've always said, like, I, I'm more interested, you know, when I did the show at the MoMA in New York, that was probably uh, one of the key exhibitions for me because I didn't enter there because I, I was just an African, you know, I wasn't part of an Africa show or a, DAS or African American show. I entered that show because of the work that I've done. So I think for a lot of artists and a lot of photographers, you know, they have to be careful to realize that, you know, it's the strength of your work that should lead, uh, not the exoticness of where you come from or what culture you're from. The, there is, uh, you know, just as a follow-up to this, like nowadays with the aftermath of uh, George Floyd, a brutal murder at the hand of the U.S. police, uh, they, like lots of museums are doing blackout in protest, showing artwork by um, uh, uh, black artists or, or uh, right. announcing and then the scrambling to hire black curators. Uh, yeah. Um, what do you think of that kind of response uh, in the art world today? It's all, uh, my, my, my question is, where were you all this time? You know what I mean? This is my, my question is that, uh, you know, you, you have to have somebody like George Floyd to die in order for you to wake up, which is very ironic in itself. And, and this is the conversation we've been having for a long time. You know, uh, even uh, someone like W.B. Du Bois was talking about this, you know, about, about this whole thing of inclusion. So I, I hope that it's, it's not a fad again. Uh, you know, I, I believe that action speaks louder than word. Uh, we can even really look at editors, for example. So if you look at the global media, how many people of color are editors, you know? Uh, when you look at all these global competitions, how many people of color are, are juries in these competitions? And it's not because something provoked it. This has, we should have been on this a long time ago. So in a sense, it's like, I think it's good that they're doing it, but I hope that they're building 
not a, mo a temporary solution. I hope they're looking at a long-term strategy. This is what I'm interested in. So if, you, if you're looking at diversifying, if you're looking at um, you know, inclusion, then you have to look at the root of the problem as well. So when we look at, for example, photojournalists, how many people of color do we have as photojournalists? You know, even in the US, this is a major issue. You know? That means that we need to encourage more of our youth to be engaged in this sector. But that means that we need to offer more opportunities. And that comes from those that hold the power as well. So in that sense, you know, yeah, you can black out your screen and do all of that, but what is the strategy for the future? You know, is this only for this year that you're doing this? You know, what, what is the concrete plan that you're making to, to include us in these different conversations? You know, and, and that's, how, that's how I see it. Uh, but, you know, as, as I mentioned, this is not, uh, they shouldn't have to have, have been this kind of extreme thing to happen for them to wake up and realize, oh, we need to make more effort. And, I, and Salah, I don't need to tell you about these global art fairs and these global festivals, how many Africans are in it, how many people of color are in it. It's very small, you know? And now I, I'm seeing things coming out, but my whole thing is I would feel more comfortable if, if they said, okay, this is our long-term strategy. So if you're a museum, what is your long-term strategy to acquisition more female artists and more uh, artists of color? You know, like, what is that strategy? This is what I'm more interested in. Yeah, I mean, of course, just to, to, to reinforce what you said is that the simple thing is that by not including others, by not including, you're depriving yourself from maybe three quarters of the world, you know, um, uh, and contribution to art. I mean, by inclusion or by, it, it doesn't have to be an affirmative action. It, it could be just a policy that, to, to represent the world as it is. Art history will be much more diverse will be much more global, uh, will show the complexity of, of the art world itself. So I, yeah, wanna... I just want to say, yeah, sorry to interrupt, I, I forgot to mention this. The, the other thing also is I think for these global institutions, especially art departments around the world, when you talk about Europe, when, when you're talking about in the US, um, it's, unfor it's really unfortunate Salah, that a lot of these art institutions don't really make an effort to also look at the global uh, art scene, you know, it's usually what these young people are learning, even these young curators, what, what they're learning is a lot of it is based on the usual suspects, you know, so even for me, what, when I'm teaching classes in Europe or wherever, I'm not showing things from Europe or the US, I'm showing things from the continent, from Middle East and Asia. So for a lot of these institutions, there has to be a reform also in the educational system. There has to be a reform, not just in the higher institutions, but also in the lower levels uh, of school. And that's where that real beginning, this is what I'm talking about, this strategy for the long term. You know, it, it's, it's not just this, oh, we're gonna do one exhibition or do one acquisition. It's not about that, but there has to be a reform in regards to uh, these perceptions and perspectives that have been formed uh, all this time that were not included in the educational system fully. Yeah, so let me end with one question that is uh, start uh, by saying you started uh, you uh, either with eliminating the key topic of representation in relation to your uh, interest. Mm -hmm. This is great. How would you describe Western photography's role in describing a certain history of representation of African people, the national geographic type, maybe? Uh, I'm talking here about the West, not as a geographic, uh, a geographical location, but as a practice of othering as an enterprise. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this is what we're doing in Africa is to reshift and to present the other side of that perspective. Uh, I don't need to tell you, all you have to do is Google, uh, look at the historical images of uh, any country in Africa, even for Ethiopia, a lot of it especially these anthropological images uh, are problematic because they only offered one side and basically they, they, were, they were taken back to home base to perpetuate that perception within their own society. So in that sense, uh, you know, even if you look at the numbers, you know, photographers are mostly men, mostly white men uh, who have access and privilege that are different from those that are in the continent or different, uh, you know, different parts of uh, Asia or Middle East. And in that sense, it becomes problematic. You know, it's imagine that I go to France or imagine that France is only documented by Ethiopian photographers in its history, you know, imagine that. So th that's how ridiculous it sounds, you know? So right now we're in a generation because of technology, because of connectivity and these networks that we have, 
this is why all of a sudden photography from Africa is coming up because uh, there's all these photographers that are showing their reality and their perspective. So, you know, it, and this has been spoken about in the past, you know, there, there is a danger of the one-sided story. So all these images that you see from historical, even to the contemporary, the biggest issue is that, you know, I did this project about how much cultural perception or, you know, your cultural background impacts how you photograph when you arrive in somebody's country that you've never been to, or you don't know the history or their culture, you know? And this is why I say education is so important. So a lot of the times that perspective also matters of who's behind the camera. This is what it always comes back to. So whether it's Nat Geo, whether it's, you know, in, in New York Times, any of these uh, publications, yeah, those images are distorted because they were perpetuating a specific sort of uh, ideology in a way, but, but they didn't offer us the other side, you know? So for example, what, when, I, when I talk about, for example, the war in Syria, what I'm interested in is how are people living in Syria? Who are the Syrian photographers showing us the daily life? Because I want to see that reality as well. We know the war is there, we know all the suffering is happening, but what is the other side as well? And, and this is the unfortunate thing in photography, you know, it's supposed to be like this democratic tool, but for me, it has not been fully democratic because it's been based on access, it's been based on privilege. You know, there's all these things uh, that have come about and even if you look at 20, 30 years ago, you know, be, before the digital age, imagine you're a photographer in Africa, you have to wait for somebody to bring you films, you know, you have to wait for some, you know, to have the paper to print out. So we didn't have this connection with different editors globally because it was such a process, you know? So right now we, we're in our advantage, I think, and I, I encourage a lot of young people to engage in uh, being part of this visual language, uh, sharing with the world who they are, uh, not for fame or money, but, you know, to, to be truthful to what they're representing in that. And I often tell, you know, young photographers, if you're trying to be rich and famous, photography is not the road for you. You know, you, you have to, you have to be truthful <laughs> in what you, what you want to express, but there is a relevance because the only way we can combat racism, remember, racism is based on a system, it's based on an institution, and image is part of that system. So for me, it comes back to that. It means that we have to be part of that conversation, that we need more image producers, we need more editors, more curators, and so forth, because our story is far more complex than a single image. I just actually uh, uh, want to say at the end that I'm going to just give one more question because it's important in the context of what I would be saying, is that this conversation is part of a larger project that we have been undertaking. Uh, by the African Institute, which is leading up uh, to 2023, when we start, uh, we have our wonderful building designed by David I.J., the British Ghanaian uh, architect, and uh, uh, but we and, and we starting of the PhD and the master program and the African language program. Uh, we've also started what they call a uh, country focus series. So we started with Ethiopia for many reasons. Ethiopia for us um, is closer to the Arabian Peninsula. It is part of the, uh, it's only the Red Sea. It's never been, uh, uh, you know, uh, the interaction is as old as uh, uh, millennia. And if you think about that, the first uh, 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 asylees uh, uh, sent by the Prophet uh, Muhammad uh, were actually when they were persecuted is to uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and, and so these are things that people forgot, but Ethiopia is in the backyard and is in the front yard too, culture and so forth. So uh, the organizers on the Ethiopia uh, 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 focus season are uh, wonderful colleagues. I'm sure you know them as friends too. Professor Dagmar Wopshit from the University of Pennsylvania, Elizabeth Georges from the University of Addis Ababa, and Surafel uh, Wondemo, who is also from the University of Addis Ababa. They've done a wonderful work. We are having a conference coming and we hope to have you and everybody else. I think we may end up having it online considering COVID-19. Uh, uh, you know, 19. But I wanna end up with the last question because it came from a special person, Dagmawi Wupshi. He said, this is wonderful conversation, Aida. I wonder if you can say more about uh, how you have been able to wet your identity as an Ethiopian and also as a diasporic African. Having lived in the U.S. for some time, how does that expansive experience of being black in the world shape your aesthetics? I mean, it's. It, I always say that you know Ethiopia 
gave birth to me, but the world raised me. And I've been privileged to experience many different cultures around the world. Um, and it's funny because when I, when I lived in the West, there was always this question of my identity because I, I never felt like I belonged. And it wasn't until I went back home, you know, to Ethiopia that I realized where my place was. And, and often I think as Africans, uh, we forget that there's different types of Africans. You know, Af Africans are not just one component or one type. So for example, for me, I'm a different kind of African, but I'm still an African in that sense. And when it comes to the identity, it took me a while to really process that and to find a sense of belonging. But that also came about with the realization is that I should not be seeking validation from anybody. I need to validate myself first. Uh, this is what it comes down to. Where do I feel home? Where do I feel connected? You know, And that takes time within it. But you know, even in the work that I do, you know, I've, I've put in some symbols of Ethiopia in there because I cannot deny my roots. You know, I, I grew up inside the culture, even as an immigrant, I was still an Ethiopian living abroad. Um, but when I came back home, it was very strange because I felt like I belonged and then I felt like I didn't belong. And then I had to decide, okay, I need to carve out where, where is my road, you know, where is my, my definition of home? And in that sense, it wasn't denying, you know, uh, my Western side, it wasn't denying my Ethiopian side but it was taking the positive from both sides and basically carving out my own world uh, within that. And often people say in my work, you know, I'm, I'm creating my own planet or my own reality within it. And this is how it's coming out. But, uh, but when it comes to my identity, you know, I remember there was one photographer who said, oh, you know, but you're not African. And I said, what do you mean? You know, and, and it's always surprising to hear these kind of things because for some reason, we have made ourselves believe, you know, what really an African is, but we haven't had the conversation of the complexities of being an African, you know? You can have an African named Muhammad and you can have an African named Thomas, you know? It, it's, it's a fascinating continent in that sense that we exist in so many spaces and we exist between the past, the present and the future. I find this super fascinating. And often uh, when we look at identity, you know, we forget the richness of our past and sometimes we don't imagine the future as well. So for me in that sense, uh, nobody can validate me. You know, I know my space and my place within that, but I've also accepted that I come from so many different uh, identities and I come from all these different cultures that have been infused inside of me through my travels and my childhood. Thank you so much really, uh, Aida. Uh, it has been a wonderful, uh, like you know, conversation full of a lot of insights from you about your work and about your wonderful work. Uh, it has been very thoughtful, insightful, and uh, I personally and many people I'm sure watching learn a great deal. I want to end up by thanking you, of course, of all the people, but I want to thank also the staff that really worked very hard to uh, produce this. Uh, that is my colleague, Satan Al Hassan. Uh, Sharif uh, and BJ, uh, especially Sharif, worked a lot on the technical part. Uh, others, Sarah, Selma, Reem, Hajir, uh, uh, our associate director, and, and many people really. Producing this is, has been a really teamwork, and I'm, I'm very proud to say that it has been a, a great uh, accomplishment. So thank you so much, uh, Aida, and thanks to all of you that uh, around the world that has been uh, followed. No, Salah, yes. I, I really want, I mean, I have to give you my, my gratitude and thank you to the team and everybody as well. I mean, it's, uh, it's a, I know, you know, it's, it's a very, very big show and uh, it's quite an important show, uh, especially for the region. I would encourage everybody to go and see it virtually uh, if you're not physically there. But, uh, you know, I remember when we first started talking about this show and I'm very happy that it's come to this point, but I think this is also a testament to your vision and also, uh, you know, to the strength of pushing things forward. And I'm very excited for the future of the Africa Institute as well. And I'm looking forward to uh, sort of seeing all the different programming. And I think it's very important, especially for the Middle East, to have an institution like this to show, you know, who we really are outside of what the media says we are. And, uh, you know, I uh, give you all the best of luck and uh, thank you so much for everything. And I hope to see you sh soon, inshallah. Sure, inshallah. The, the, the show is open and it would be uh, available, I think, for audience with some restrictions, of course, with COVID-19, but also uh, for everyone, you can download the, the catalog, the booklet for the show. Uh, it's beautifully designed and well produced, uh, but it's also, we are working on a bigger catalog and there is also, of course, the virtual 
tour if you can make it to the UAE. Thank you so much and thank you. Thank you and so much. Thanks thank a lot. You.